All right, so we know Notre Dame is loaded at the running back position this season. That much is obvious. But do the Irish have the best running back room in the entire country? You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Irish. It is Tuesday, April 11th, and thank you for making this your first listen of the day. As always, this show is available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. So whether you're watching or listening, please take a moment to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. My name is Tyler Wojak, and I'm the host. I'm a Notre Dame alum and producer for college football talent at the Fox Sports headquarters in Los Angeles. I hope you guys had a great Easter weekend to those of you who celebrate, and I appreciate you joining me here on this Tuesday. And in today's episode, we're going to do a deep dive in the Notre Dame running back room and compare it to some of the best in college football because Dylan McCullough, Notre Dame's running backs coach and run game coordinator, anointed his group as the best in the, in the entire country during his press conference at the end of last week. And at first, I'm going to be honest, I thought, that's pretty bold. Like, I'm high on him too, but that's one hell of a claim. But then when I thought about it further, I realized he might actually be right here. Uh, Then we'll close things out with some shout-outs around the bend uh, because it was another big weekend for Notre Dame Athletics, especially the now number one ranked men's lacrosse team. So stick around for that. But let's go back to the running backs here because last Thursday, we got a chance to hear from Dylan McCullough and three of his guys, Audrey Estimate, Jabron Payne, and Jadarian Price after practice. I think Logan Dick spoke to a couple of reporters on the side, but he didn't take the podium as far as I know. And one of the reporters there, I'm not sure who it was, so I apologize whoever it was, but they asked McCullough to talk about the potential of his group this season, and here's what he had to say. Well, I mean, the characteristics, I mean, I got the full gamut of what I wanted. I believe I got the best running back group, you know, in the country, you know, as far as production, mindset, just physical attributes, leadership, all the things you need to be successful. So, I mean, I got speed. I got power, you know, I got knowledge of the game, I got savvy, I got leadership, change of direction, pass protection, I got all of the components to make us an upper end team. Now, if you've ever talked to a running back at literally any level of football, I'm talking from peewee to high school to college to pro, running backs certainly do not lack confidence. Um, it borderlines it's it borderlines on delusion in some cases, but that's kind of what you need in order to play the position and coach it as well. Dylan McCullough played running back himself, but you really need to be that level of you need to have that level of confidence to play because a lot of the times you're getting the ball and you're running just straight into chaos in the line of scrimmage where you're getting hit by dudes who are way bigger and way stronger than you a lot of cases and then hopefully you break three and you get a big run but they take a lot of hits to their body it's a lot of mileage on the body and you look at the NFL it's why these guys don't really last that long because just the physical toll it takes them so in order to do that and do that successfully you have to be uberly confident to play the position. So when I first heard this, I thought, like, is this just an overly confident running backs coach talking up his guys? Um, Or does Notre Dame have a legitimate case at having the best running back room in all of college football? So I feel like in order to answer this question, first we have to define what is, what does it mean to be the best when it comes to the best running back room in college football? So I mean, the obvious thing you got to point out is the overall production in the room. Like, how much do your running backs produce uh, running the ball, catching pass out of the backfield, and blocking as well? Because that's a critical component uh, to being a running back that's often overlooked. So when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, first priority, how good is your number one? How good is your starting running back? You know, are they elite? Can they carry your team? Can they take the bulk of the carries and consistently get five to six yards on the ground? That's going to be the most important thing I look at this. But go, looking beyond just the starter, how big is the drop-off between the starter and your backup? Because as I was just saying, running backs take a lot of hits and you got to be able to share the rock. So you really need a, a great one-two punch, not just in college football, but really in the pros as well. You see it all the time. So those are the two biggest things that I'm looking for. How good is your one? And then how good is your two? And then there's a kind of a, a significant gap here as I look to the third criteria. How versatile is the unit as a whole? Like, do you have different skill sets? How deep is the room? How many different guys can you bring in and out? And then lastly, what does the future look like? How have you recruited the position? How's the talent at sort of the lower end of the depth chart? So keep this criteria in mind as we go through what Notre Dame has on the roster. And Richard sophomore Audrick Esme is the number one running back right now. He's the leading rusher last season uh, in terms of yards. If you look at his 2022 stats, he had 156 carries, 920. 920 yards, which comes out to 5.9 yards per carry. Really impressive stuff. He had 11 touchdowns and even had nine receptions for 135 for 135 yards and a touchdown. 
Most impressive stat in all of this, Estime had 569 yards after contact last season, which means every time he got hit, on average, he'd get 3.65 additional yards after that. It's really impressive. Now, obviously, if you're listening to this or watching this, you watched the running football play all of last season. You saw how physical the runner estimate is. So you you know that he's physical and he can get yards after contact. But still, when you hear that out loud, 569 after contact, that's really impressive. Uh, now, he could probably even had better stats had he not had that fumbling issue. He had three fumbles last season. Um, that hurt him, hurt his overall production because he didn't really play a lot against UNLV. That one fumble against Stanford was so critical. Big reason why they lost that game, but it also impacted his stats as well for the rest of the season. But then Notre Dame bet on him. He had a nice bounce back game against Syracuse and then really took off there at the end. Looking ahead to this season, it looks like Esme is poised to have an even better year than last year. He's slimmer. I think Dylan McCullough said he cut out 7 to 8% body fat, which is really impressive. Any of you who have ever tried to lose weight or lose weight, you know how hard it is to lose that amount of body fat. So, the fact that he was able to do that, look, he was already in awesome shape. Like you've seen the pictures, you saw how big and strong he is. But it sounds like he's still maintaining that level of strength, but he's slimmer, which makes him more mobile, more agile, and faster in the open field. So he could have the best season of his career this year, but not, lo- not, not far off from SMA. He's got some competition here in Logan Diggs, who actually, for his career, has more yards. Um, Diggs had 1,052 yards in his career, which comes out to 4.8 yards per carry because Diggs obviously played a little bit more his true freshman season. He has seven touchdowns on the ground. He also added 16 receptions for 267 receiving yards and three touchdowns through the air. Now, he barely played at the start of last season because of an injury he suffered in the spring game last year. Uh, I think he had a torn labrum. He was somehow able to get back and like actually dress for the beginning, but then he was a DNP against Cal, but then really started to come on against North Carolina. He had that touchdown there when he was wide open on that wheel, and then he broke out against BYU, had 17 carries for 93 yards. So if you look at Estime and Diggs, that's a really, really good one-two punch. It's not your traditional thunder and lightning, even though Estime certainly fits the mold of thunder. I wouldn't say that Diggs is like a lightning back because he's really physical himself, and especially at the end of last season, man, he ran so hard. And one issue that he had his freshman season is he's really, uh, he was almost too patient trying to get through the hole. Now he hits it hard and he's able to get yards after contact. So that's a really good one-two punch. Diggs is admittedly not the best pass blocker. Uh, There was one play last year against Cal where he like completely whiffed. And it was, uh, or not Cal, I think it was against Marshall. It was really bad. So I think that's another reason why I wasn't getting a ton of PT early on. But they, again, Great one, too. Then you look at uh, the third running back, and I'm including senior Chris Tyree in this because even though he's cross-training at receiver right now, I still think that Tyree's probably going to get some carries out of the backfield. We'll see. Um, I, I guess we'll see in the future how much Tyree is going to play at receiver. But for now, let's include him here in this group of running backs, even if next year he's going to play a little bit more wide receiver. But I, the fact that he's even doing that, I think, tells you about his skill set. We know he can run the ball. First career has 229 carries. 1,162 yards, which is about 5.1 yards per carry. And then as a receiver, he has 56 receptions, which is really impressive, and then 461 yards and four touchdowns. He's actually better at running in between the tackles than you might think. Now, I know he's a little guy compared to the other dudes. He's only 5'9", around 200 pounds. But he actually averaged 4.3 yards per carry on inside runs last season. So that's a really good number three. And the fact that they moved him out, I think he's still going to be able to play a little bit running back next year. But... He's also not a really a great blocker because of his size, uh, because of his size. But he's got a really diverse skill set, and his experience makes him a solid number three. Okay, now let's move on to retro freshman Jadarian Price, who obviously missed all of last season with the torn Achilles that he suffered last summer. That wiped out his entire freshman year, which is really uh, and really unfortunate for him. It was an unfortunate setback because he was poised to have a really good freshman year. He was so good through the summer that it looked like he was going to force his way onto the field and get some carries. But then he suffers that injury. It's a big setback, but. The coaches have been very high on him, both publicly and privately. And then Dylan McCullough reiterated that strong praise again this past Thursday. Take a listen. Extremely excited about him. He was um, participating in some of the stretches and stuff like that today, moving around. Um, Real confident and excited about his return. This is not the first time that McCullough has praised Price publicly. Uh, He's been very open about how high he is on him and his potential at Notre Dame. Now, right now, it looks like he's still not nearly full go in spring practice. We're not going to see him in the spring game, but hopefully by fall, 
He's going to be at least full go in practice. I still don't think we'll see him a ton early on in this season, but hopefully by like, you know, mid October, late October, he's starting to get some serious game reps as well and take some of the burden off uh, eggs or <laughs> eggs and take some of the burden off estimate and digs. But we still need to see it in action. There are plenty of reasons to be optimistic about him. And the fact that he's the third or fourth running back right now says a lot. But uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what he can actually do on Saturdays. And then you've got another retro freshman, Jabron Payne. Probably the least talked about back in the room right now. And it makes sense. I mean, he was a very late commitment to Notre Dame. He didn't commit until April uh, of 2022, two months after National Signing Day. Dylan McCullough went after him hard once he took over the job. Now, Notre Dame had actually offered him a scholarship beforehand, but then once McCullough came over from Indiana, he really went after Payne. Now, to give you some insight onto Payne's recruitment, he really broke out onto the scene as a sophomore and then just lit up the stat sheet. But then his junior and senior seasons, he was dealing with a lot of injuries. He actually apparently missed a good chunk of last season, at least during the early portion of the year, because of a hamstring injury. He did get some reps um, at kick returner, but it looks like they just wanted to redshirt him and not waste that year of eligibility. So he could be a very good player in the future. And I think the fact that he's the, what, fifth back right now is very encouraging. And we haven't even mentioned Jeremiah Love yet. He's going to be a true freshman this season. He's actually not even on campus yet. He's still in high school, but he comes in with a ton of height. He's six foot 190 pounds, um, hails from St. Louis, Missouri. He's the number five running back in the class of 2023 and the number 79 player overall, according to the 24-7 sports composite. He's actually the highest running back recruit to sign with Notre Dame since Greg Bryant. And I, I mean, this was a big time get for Notre Dame. They really had to push for this one. I know he was looking at Texas A&M pretty hard. So obviously winning a recruiting battle against them and the type of NIL money that they offer is a big win for the program. And he's an elite athlete that can do a bunch of different things. There was even some talk about him potentially coming in and playing receiver because he's that good at catching the ball and he's that good in open space. But for now, he's going to be a running back. He does need to bulk up a bit and he needs how to learn. He needs how to learn how to run inside the tackles. Um, I know that was part of the scouting report coming out of high school, and I have full faith that Dylan McCullough is going to teach him how to do that because, like I was saying earlier, that was a problem with Diggs where he was a little bit too patient and wouldn't hit the hole like he needed to. That might be the case with Love, but again, he doesn't need to come in and get a bunch of carries right away. He can learn, he can develop, and then hopefully in the future, the near future, he'll be able to break through and get some carries because he is a really special athlete. So if you look at the group as a whole, it's clear that they're extremely talented. Um, I would say pretty definitively, it's the best position group on the Notre Dame roster from top to bottom right now because they're really loaded at the top, but then you look at the back end of that in the future of the position, it's really, really bright. They don't have that one elite guy like Kyron Williams, at least not yet, but the one-two punch with SMA and Diggs has the potential to be the best to come through Notre Dame, uh, at least in my lifetime, which is 26 years, coming on 27 here pretty soon. But the depth of this room is really what you need when you're when you're competing for a national championship because injuries happen to every single team every single year and it comes down to can you replace one dude with another dude like that's what happens with Georgia when one of their best guys go down goes down they just reload with Alabama same deal i mean dude like they had Jalen Waddle their number one wide receiver go down with a season-ending injury after he broke his ankle against Tennessee a couple years ago and then what does the number 2 do Devontae Smith he wins the Heisman, okay? Now, I know that's an extreme example, but that's just the type of production that these kinds of schools put out every single year at most of the positions on the roster, and that's why they win national championships every single year. So if Notre Dame wants to compete for those, this is what they need at pretty much every position, but it's really strong, or it's really encouraging that they have that right now at the running back room. So now that we know what Notre Dame has in their running back room, how do they stack up against some of the best in college football? The answer coming up after this. Grand slams, no hitters, and double plays are back, and there's no better place to get in on the MLB action than FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. That's because right now, new customers can step up to the plate with a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up, place your first bet, and get up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if you don't win. Um, here's my unbiased baseball bet of the day. So the Yankees are taking on the Guardians today, and Garrett Cole is on the mound going up against Hunter Gaddis, who's a relief pitcher. It looks like the Guardians are going to do a bullpen game. And they're going up against Garrett Cole. Garrett Cole, so they've got no shot, right? Wrong. Take the Guardians plus one and a half and the under on Garrett Cole strikeouts for my same game parlay. Get those bets in now because the first pitch is at 6.10 p.m. Eastern tonight. 
Don't miss your chance to get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. FanDuel, the official partner of Major League Baseball. Thanks again for making Locked On Irish your first listen of the day. This is your reminder to subscribe to the show if you haven't already. And today, we're looking at Notre Dame's running back room and stacking it up against other elite programs in college football. And when we're looking at the best running backs in college football, um, this hurts me to say, but we got to start with Michigan because, look, as unfortunate as, as it may be, they've got clearly the best one-two punch right now in college football in Blake Corum and Donovan Edwards. Before Blake Corum got hurt last season, he was a legitimate Heisman contender. Then he suffered that injury against Illinois, and then Donovan Edwards came in, and, man, they didn't skip a beat. Like, Corum didn't play for that Ohio State game. Didn't matter. Donovan Edwards came in and ran all over him. If you look at the season in total, Corum had 247 carries for 1,463 yards. That's 5.9 yards per carry and 18 touchdowns. His backup, Edwards, had 140 carries for 990... 991 yards, so they almost had two 1,000-yard rushers. Edwards was averaging 7.1 yards per carry, and he, he got the ball 140 times. Like, that's insane. He added, he added seven touchdowns, and then behind them, they've actually got pretty decent depth in C.J. Stokes, Kalel Mullings, Benjamin Hall, and then, uh, Benjamin Hall, excuse me, and then Cole Cabana, uh, the early enrollee freshman. Stokes actually had a pretty decent year in 2022 as the third back. He had 273 yards and a touchdown. Uh, and then you got Hall. He's like a giant bowling ball. He kind of looks like SMA did when he first arrived on campus. And then Cabana was the uh, 10th ranked running back in the class of 2023. So they've got the best one two punch in the country and a lot of depth. So they've got quite the case to have the best running back room. Okay, so now let's shift over to their rival, Ohio State, who is led by Tony Alford, who, as we know, is probably the best running backs coach in the entire country. He used to coach at Notre Dame before he left to take that job at Ohio State. And he's always just pumping out elite running backs for the Buckeyes. So their one two punch is really solid. They've got Travion Henderson and Mayan Williams. Um, both of those guys are extremely talented. Probably both fill, fit into the top 15 running backs in all of college football. But both of them dealt with injuries last season that really hampered them at multiple points throughout the year. Williams finished with uh, 825 yards with 14 touchdowns. He had five touchdowns in one game last year and only played in 11 of them. He was an absolute beast. I actually saw him in person. I was at the uh, Ohio State-Iowa game, and I was on the field before the game, and I was just looking around. I was on the Ohio State side, and I saw Williams. And, I mean, this dude's thighs uh, look like tree trunks. He's just freakishly large and strong, probably not like an ounce of body fat on him. And he's the backup behind Travion Henderson, who was really, really struggled with injuries last season. He only played in eight games, and, and even in some of those games that he did play in, he was clearly not healthy. All that being said, he still had 571 yards, six touchdowns. We've seen enough flashes from him to know what he can be as a player. Henderson's not participating this spring, so they've got their backups or their guys behind them, like Trip Chip Trainum. Uh, he was the guy who transferred from Arizona State and actually expected to play linebacker at Ohio State, but then he had to move to running back uh, before the Iowa game last season because they were just so thin at the position, and he was really good. I mean, he's just a great athlete. And, I mean, he's not going to play running back in the NFL, but he was really solid given the circumstances. Dallin Hayden was also very impressive as a true freshman last season. He was their leading rusher in the CFP semifinal game against Georgia. But there are rumors swirling around that he could transfer, just given how loaded that room is right now, how many different guys, and he wants to get more touches, which I understand. He's a really talented player. So... Who knows what happens with him? That's something to keep an eye on. So if you're looking at Ohio State, again, another great one-two punch when healthy, but given the uncertainty about the health and the potential transfer in Hayden, I'm not sure if I could anoint them number one. So let's another Big Ten here. We got Penn State. They've got a they've got a good claim at this as well. Nicholas Singleton and Katron Allen, I mean, they're awesome. And <laughs> those guys, like, it would have been really nice if Notre Dame was able to secure that commitment from Singleton publicly. Uh, I know I've heard that Singleton was actually a silent commit at one point, but opted to go to Penn State and had an unbelievable true freshman season. Finished it with over 1,000 rushing yards and 12 touchdowns, and he wasn't even their leading back, at least in terms of the amount of carries. Catron Allen actually had a little bit more, uh, 167 for him as opposed to 156 for Singleton. Allen finished with 867 yards and 10 touchdowns. So, again, another great one-two punch. These guys are younger than the ones I mentioned previously in Williams and Henderson um, and Corum and Edwards. So they're both going to be sophomores. And that's really great for Penn State. The problem is that after these two guys, they've got practically no depth. 
they have three walk-ons at the running back position, and only two have seen action, uh, but both of that was in um, mop-up duty. So they've got a great one-two punch, but they're really, really just one injury away from being in serious trouble. And then another Big Ten school. I know uh, all Big Ten, but they do like to run the ball, so it makes sense they have pretty good running backs. So let's look at Wisconsin. Braylon Allen is a stud. That that's goes without saying. He was a stud against Notre Dame his freshman, freshman year, um, and I think he was like 17 at the time. He squats like 650 pounds. He's a freak. They've got a pretty good backup at Ches Malusi. Um, if you're looking at Allen's stats last year, he had the ball way more than Malusi. He had 230 carries as opposed to 112. Um, and, yeah, Braylon Allen is a bell cow back. He had 1,200 rushing yards, 11 touchdowns, and it's going to be really interesting to see what Allen is able to do this season in a spread offense with Phil Longo as the OC over there. Um, my guess is he's going to explode, to be honest with you. I know that technically his rushing yards sort of regress in his sophomore year, but then again, consider the circumstances. Like Graham Mertz was his quarterback. What do you think defense is keyed on? The run game, okay, because – we know the deal with Mertz, all right? We get it. He sucks. So moving on, they've got a third-string running back and a converted fullback over there at Wisconsin, which is maybe the most Wisconsin thing ever. His name is Jackson Acker. He didn't have a carry last season, but I guess the coaching staff is really high on him. He's, he looks like a linebacker, which makes sense. But if we're looking at the group as a whole, they've got an elite one, and they've got good depth, but still, I don't know if you could consider them the best running back room in the entire country. And then We've got to go to running back U, or at least running back U in the modern era. That's Alabama. Alabama, this might shock you guys. They're very talented at the running back position. They have five very talented backs. Rising senior Chase McClellan is probably going to, lead, going to be the lead back. Um, he dealt with some injuries throughout his career, and he's been sitting behind some guys. But I think this could be like a Brian Robinson situation, a guy who was a running back at Alabama, came in with like a lot of hype as a recruit, sat behind some really talented guys. Then when he got his moment senior year, he really came on and dominated. Um, and then he could have a future in the NFL because that's what Alabama does. They just pump out NFL running backs. I mean, you look at the bottom, they got Justice Haynes and Richard Young in the class of 2023. That's the number two and four running backs in the entire class, respectively. We know how excited we all were when Richard Young took a visit to Notre Dame. He was riding around in the Ferrari with Marcus Freeman. The fact that we were even able to get him on campus was like a win for the program. And then Alabama not only got him, they actually got a guy who was ranked higher than him. The thing, though, is with Alabama, their talent level may be the best, you know, if you're looking at recruiting profiles and all that from top to bottom. But, again, it's a lot of unproven guys that we haven't seen on Saturday. So I think we can, we got to hold off on them as the best running back room in the entire country, at least for now. Like, if there's a scenario where they, these guys just dominate this season and Alabama is the clear number one, that certainly wouldn't shock me at all. Um, now, there's another tier of teams – uh, where they have an elite one, but really no depth behind them, at least not that we know of. Ole Miss falls into this category. They got Kinshaw Junkins, who might have a claim to be the best running back in the entire country. Notre Dame wanted him as a recruit. He was so good as a true freshman that he basically pushed out uh, starter Zach Evans, who transferred over from TCU. He was a five-star number one running back in his class, and he's actually on his way to the NFL. But that's how good Judkins was. He was so talented that he basically took all of those carries away. He finished with 274 carries for 1,500 yards and 16 touchdowns as a true freshman. I mean, just those numbers are so good. That's better than anything Kyron Williams did in one single season at Notre Dame. Now, if you want to say Kyron Williams might have been able to do a little bit more in 2020 had he played a full season, I wouldn't disagree with you. But still, that's that's really impressive from a true freshman. But the fact is, Ole Miss has really, really no depth behind him. So I think they're eliminated from this. A couple of teams in this tier, uh, I would consider Arkansas in that group with Raheem Sanders and Oregon with Bucky Irving. But even though they have one elite back, I'm not as sold on the rooms as a whole. So if we look at this in summary, Michigan has the best one-two punch in college football right now. They've got solid depth behind them. Ohio State is another great one, too. But injuries and potential transfers holds them back. Penn State, two of the best young running backs in the entire country. Zero depth behind them. Wisconsin and Ole Miss could both make a claim that they have the best running back in the country. But the rest of the rooms are just okay. Alabama's Alabama, loaded with talent, but we haven't seen these guys dominate on Saturdays yet, so we'll have to wait and see with them. So after going through it, I hate to say it, but I think Michigan is actually the winner here, mostly because Corinne and Edwards were just that good last season. But that could change this season if Estime and Diggs both have the types of seasons that we think they can have. And when you consider the talent behind those guys – Notre Dame could certainly make a compelling argument for the future, but I just, I need to see it from Price. I need to see it from Jeremiah Love before I can say from top to bottom, 
Notre Dame has the best running backs room in the entire country. Okay, coming up next, we'll wrap up today's show with some shout-outs and closeouts around the bend this past weekend. All right, let's get to shout-outs and closeouts, and we got to start with a huge shout-out to the Notre Dame men's lacrosse team. Over this past weekend, we had a matchup between number one Duke versus number two Notre Dame uh, at Arlotta Stadium in front of us packed, sold-out crowd, and they got to see Notre Dame dominate and win 17-12. to Pat Cavanaugh had eight points. His brother Chris tied his career high with five goals, and it was kind of a close game early on, and then Notre Dame had a 7-1 to stretch to take a 9-4 lead right before halftime. And uh, I saw this stat. The 17 goals the Irish scored are the most a Duke defense has allowed since dropping a 17-16 to decision to number 15 UNC in overtime in 2016. The last time Duke allowed 17 or more goals in regulation came in 2015. Notre Dame is now 3-1 and one in program history in games featuring number one versus number two. So shout out to the men's lacrosse team, Coach Corgan and the boys. They've got a real shot at winning a national championship this season. So I'm pumped. I actually watched the game today on replay had it on in the background while I was working, and it's fun, man. I, I'm going to be honest, I wasn't a big lacrosse guy growing up. I was more of a baseball, baseball guy, but this team is fun to watch. I'm excited uh, to watch them on this journey going forward the rest of the season. Um, also, a shout-out to Notre Dame Baseball. They clinched another series win over the weekend against Pitt, taking two games to one. They've started to figure things out a little bit at the plate. They've got another big series on the road this weekend coming up against Clemson, so Hopefully, they continue this trend and they be, they're able to uh, finish strong here as we get towards the end of the season. And let's hear it for Coach Gump's women's softball squad. I'm actually kind of ashamed and embarrassed by myself for not giving a shout-out to this group earlier because I think I mentioned this before on the podcast. One of my jobs when I was a student at Notre Dame was that I was a color commentator for the women's softball team. And it was a lot of fun, man. Uh, it was a fun team to watch. They, they play a cool style of play, lots of action, like to get on the base pass and run around. And uh, they, they won a big weekend series against Louisville this past weekend. But, but unfortunately, they were unable to clinch the sweep. But the team is now 23-11 and on the season. They moved to 7-7-1 seven, seven and one in ACC play. And I'm telling you, if you, uh, if you haven't read about Coach Gunf and what the team is doing over there, uh, I'd encourage you to do so because she kind of – She's been around for a really long time in Notre Dame, and then she's got a good thing going over there with the women's softball squad. But that's going to do it for me today. Thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. On the way out, remember to subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts, and give us a follow on Twitter at Locked On Irish, on Instagram at Locked On Irish Pod, and my personal Twitter account at Tyler Wojak. That's at Tyler W O J C I A K. I'll see you guys tomorrow.